How many people can say that D&D saved their life? Probably more than you realize. Today's episode comes with a content warning for talk of suicide and suicidal ideation, but these stories show us how gaming can be an amazing tool for mental health. So today, I'm proud to share with you another way to think about why games matter. Welcome to Replay, the show that invites you to join us at the game table. I'm your host, Clara Mount. On Replay, we are building a more inclusive community by creating a space for underrepresented gamers and their allies to share their voice. We'll tell stories about our experiences and provide new perspectives that challenge our community to think a little differently about who we are and what we do. Replay is a Victor Media Group original. You can find episodes of this and all other Victor Media Group shows on our website at victormediagroup.co. And if you like what you're hearing, subscribe and connect with us on your favorite social media platform. Today's guest is Missa Dawson. She is the manager of a local game store called The Gaming Goat in Mason, Mason, Ohio. In her role here, she runs community events and game tournaments, so she's heavily involved in their local game community. She also helped establish the Adventure Goddesses program with Superheroines, etc., and the Cincinnati Adventures Guild, and that's a program that teaches women to run tabletop games, so um, she's definitely been a leader in their local community. And of course, she's also a DM and a player just because she loves it. Uh, so I'm very grateful to have her on the show today. Welcome to Replay, Missa. Thanks, Claire. I'm happy to be here. So our first uh, segment is um, really just getting to know you and gaming and your history with it and why you love it, why you play. Uh, so we're just going to jump right on in. And I'm going to ask you, what is the number one reason that people should care about games? Uh, in my opinion, like... The number one reason people should care about games is because it really, um, it really fosters like society. Like it really, you can sitting around the table with your friends and, you know, making shit up or playing a game or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing better than that feeling. Like just being there and being, um, I guess present. with get, yeah, present with your people. Um, so, I mean, that's why I think people should care about games, <laughs> whether you care about that or not. <laughs> that is somebody else's problem, whether they care about it. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> what was your first introduction to gaming? Uh, so, I mean, I guess my first introduction to gaming was like things like Monopoly and life and stuff. Um, my sister and I loved Monopoly growing up. Oh, I love Monopoly too. <laughs> we would we would play a game that would last weeks. Wow. Like we would play all the way through it. And so like every day we just sit there, sit in my room, on the floor of my room, playing Monopoly all day long. And then at the end of the day, we'd write down everything and we'd pack it away. Oh my and then the God. next day we'd get it back out and we'd set everything back up exactly how it was. Oh my God. And we'd keep playing. And I think we had a game legit go two weeks one time. Wow. But that was kind of my first thing, like my baby introduction into gaming, mm -hmm. I guess, uh, was just those family games. Um, it really wasn't until a lot later that I got into like what I consider the hobbyist gaming. Mm -hmm. Um which started with magic okay magic um, the gathering yeah i i met a guy who you know, ended up being my partner for like five years um but he was really into all kinds of gaming and um he convinced me to try magic and it just kind of went from there <laughs> um from magic to rpgs and then into board games and that just my entire life revolves around gaming now that's amazing. <laughs> That's I know. fantastic. I know. <laughs> so it's uh, kind of kind of the best life. Yeah. Uh, what are your favorite kinds of games now, and why? I really have to go with RPGs. Mm -hmm. um, the role play aspect is just amazing. 
but also the communal storytelling mm-hmm. um, is one of my favorite things to do. Whether I'm DMing or I'm playing, like, I just, I love that people coming together to tell a story. Um, do you and, feel like you're really, like, narrative-driven when you play, too, then? Um, yeah, I, I, I love a good narrative. Um, I have a couple uh, GMs right now who are just really good at building that world. Ooh, cool. um, And stuff, one of whom is, like, my first GM, was my first GM, and I still play with him. Oh, um, I love that. <laughs> and stuff. So, so, um... And he, he is just amazing at building a world and building a story. Um, but also just, like, um, like I have one DM who's, like, so good at building a good story and narrative, but also leaves the entire world open to us. Oh, cool. Like, you always feel like you have multiple directions that you can go in. And it really feels like choice. Like, he's really good at that sandbox-style gaming. Oh, that's so hard to do, too. <laughs> it is so hard. Like, he has reams of notes. Like, okay, if they decide to interact with this person in the town and they get take the, take on this side quest, then, you know, this is everything I need to know for that side quest. And, you know, he has literally, like, five, six scenarios completely planned out for us at all times. Oh, that's awesome. So... Moving right along, could you tell me about a gaming experience that was significant to you and why? I really have to say the moment I joined my first RPG. Tell me about it. So, like, I was painfully shy. Mm -hmm. And um, that same same guy who got me into magic, um, he would tell me these amazing stories about like he and his friends went on this adventure and like this thing and like all this stuff happened and stuff. And I'm just sitting there like, what are you talking about? Like you play, you play this game and you do these things. Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. And so eventually I sat in to watch a session Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, okay, this is kind of cool. And so I was invited to join the game Mm -hmm. and it is a complex custom system and stuff and my first character I had no idea what I was doing Uh, the GM GM (laughs) sat down with me like 15 minutes before the first game which is not enough time to build a character in in that system (laughs) even now I need more time than that to build a character in that system Um, and it's just like well kind of what do do you want to do like blah 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 blah. and I was like, like I don't know and stuff but mm-hmm. I got a character made, and I'm, that first session was just magic. Yeah? Like, it just clicked for me. Like, I was still super shy and, like, super unsure of myself and, like, didn't really want to, like, didn't really know what to do or how mm-hmm. to engage and stuff. But, like, everybody was super chill, super awesome, really good at, like, bringing me into the story and bringing me into that communal storytelling that I love so much now Mm -hmm. and it just sparked the addiction (laughs) it just like and it is an addiction I have a serious problem I'm in like six games right now oh my god (laughs) you crazy person like like, I have is now every Wednesday Saturday and Sunday I have games wow they run on alternate weeks so it's just like one Wednesday I have this game and the next Wednesday I have this game and then one Saturday I have this game and the next Saturday I have this game and you know (laughs) it is kind of insane especially because I also work an insane amount yeah but you weren't joking when you said gaming is your life now (laughs) gaming is my life and stuff and also like I I live with the people who own the the gaming goat Mm -hmm. and um the game that I work at specifically <laughs> um so like I'll come home from work and it's like what do we want to do tonight let's play games <laughs> man <laughs> and go down to our our ma- it's not massive it's a pretty decent sized gaming library um 
and we'll pick out a game and we'll play a game for a few hours before we go to bed and stuff. And it's literally like, I just worked all day in a game store and I'm coming home and we're going to eat dinner and I'm going to play more games. And that's so cool. The next day I'm going to come home from work and I'm going to play a game and I'm going to play this RPG, you know. <laughs> Did you ever imagine, like, that first day when you stepped into that game and you played for the first time, did you ever imagine that this is where you're going to end up? No, absolutely not. Like, I never even imagined that I would enjoy working retail. Mm. Because at the, at the core of it, you know, we're a retail store. Right. Um, I I love it there. Like, it's my it's my home. Aww. <laughs> um. And especially because, like, I was with it from, like, the day we opened. So it's also kind of my little baby that I helped build and stuff. Aww. And I helped build that entire community. And, like, I just, you know, it's my baby. Like, I worked healthcare for 10 years. And I really enjoyed it mm -hmm. um, and stuff. And from the time I was six years old, I knew I was going into healthcare. Oh, wow. And stuff. And healthcare was always just my calling, my thing. Um, and when I eventually made the decision to leave healthcare, it devastated me. Yeah. Um, like, it was a hard pill to swallow, um, not knowing if I would ever be able to go back to it. And now I can't imagine doing anything other than running this game store. Wow. That's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. That's such a good, like, journey. <laughs> it is. Um, but definitely I never ever imagined ending up right where I am right now. It's been a twisted road. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask one last question about gaming. I just want to know, what does gaming really mean to you? Friendship. Like, it just really, it is just, like I said before, it is just all about friends. And, um, especially as you know, I'll get into a little bit later, um, coming from where I started before I got into gaming and stuff and what gaming has really provided to me mm -hmm. has been friends and not just friends, but people who accept you yeah, for who you are. Like, it just... Like, we're all nerds. We're all the same kind of, you know, people, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But being able to sit around the table with people who are like you and feel that connection and feel that community and that, that it just, it's awesome. <laughs> That's amazing. So... We're going to uh, take a quick break from this point. Um, so thank you so much for talking to us about why you love games and why they're important to you. Um, when we get back, we are going to talk more about your chosen topic, which is how gaming can actually impact your mental health. So stay tuned, everybody. Welcome back to Replay. We are here today with Missa Dawson, who's a huge proponent of gaming and mental health. Uh, she's a game store manager, so she's very involved in her community. And we're just going to get started with this cool story that she has to tell us today. So uh, when we talked before, you told me that you had a story, kind of your journey with gaming, right, from the beginning to where you are now and how that's made such a huge impact on your mental health. You've already mentioned how you were just painfully shy before you started playing any games, really, and you are clearly not that person anymore, obviously. You're on my podcast with me talking about games and how much you love it, so can you just start that story for me? Yeah, so... I grew up in kind of an, you know, not a great family life and stuff. And so I did grow up very painfully shy. But more than that, I grew up really, really afraid mm. um, of being myself and how people would perceive me um, and just terrified that people would hate me. Wow. Um, so... You know, I, I grew up with kind of this mental mantra of if I was not making people around me perfectly happy all the time, then I was a complete failure as a human being. Wow. Um, so I strived always to make the people around me happy 
And when I couldn't do that, I hated myself. Um, and so I, you know, I kind of, kind of kept going with this a little bit for a while, for quite a while. Um, it wasn't until I was in my early Mm twenties, um, that I kind of started seeing my own power. Um, and a lot of that came from my getting involved in paganism, um, Mm -hmm. and, you know, claiming my own power as a witch and stuff. And there's a lot of like inter, you know, inner working and stuff that goes along with that. Um, so I kind of already started to like recognize that I was not responsible for other people's happiness, but I was still really shy because I didn't know how to be myself. Yeah. Like, I didn't know how people would, you know, accept me or, you know, I didn't really know who I was. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I met this guy I mentioned before, um, at, <laughs> at a bar, <laughs> I was very drunk. Um, I had heard about him cause he was very prominent in the community. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some reason I was at the bar getting yet another drink. Uh, and I heard someone say his name behind me and I just spun around. I was like, so you're ex. Um, don't know if he appreciate <laughs> me putting his name on the air. So we're just going to say, uh, and X is a great name. Like, yeah, <laughs> X is a great name. Um, and he was just like, yeah. And I was like, okay. And I just kind of walked off. <laughs> <laughs> I got my drink, my drink came and I just kind of left. Well, he reached out to me on social media after that. And, um, we decided to meet up and Mm -hmm. then like I mentioned he got me into magic but it was still like you know just me and him Mm -hmm. and like I could kind of start opening up and being myself with him but I was still terrified of people around him like he had roommates and like I was terrified that they would hate me for being in their house oh wow so like I'd make him check the hallway before I went to the bathroom to make sure nobody was out there (laughs) and so um, and, I, and it was just this petrification that people would like hate me and people would not like, you know, they would hate me for just being there for just existing or stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, eventually, I also stopped being afraid of like his roommates um, <laughs> and realized that they didn't hate me for being in their house and that they were also cool people. And um, one of them was my first GM um, and stuff. So. <clears throat> I started learning how I could be myself. And a lot of that actually came out through um, the game that I was playing in because mm-hmm. you're playing this character. Mm-hmm. And this is where I think um, RPGs especially can be really beneficial in mental health and people with social anxieties and social um, development issues mm-hmm. because it gives you a platform to be someone else Hmm. you don't have to be yourself and in that platform as someone else you can test the waters of social interaction without feeling like you're putting yourself on the line it's safe so it's safe it's a safe place to kind of explore being something that maybe you would want to be yourself Mm -hmm. you know explore being this adventurous person who does these crazy things like seduce all the guards you know (laughs) because of course I played the succubus naturally Um, (laughs) not natural to me at the time but since since it would be yeah that would kind of be a natural thing for me these days uh but um it I really started seeing it have a profound um, impact on my mental health and on that social development that I had been lacking for most of my life. Mm -hmm. I had this great group of people around me who accepted me at face value for everything that I was, you know, accepted that I was painfully shy, took the effort to engage me, Mm -hmm. um, and bring me out of my shell and show me this wonderful wide world that I had been missing out on and let me feel acceptance 
I love that. <laughs> I love that so much. <laughs> um, and so those those people were my first experience with like, true acceptance. From there, I just blossomed. Mm-hmm. Um, what but was it, I, what was it about that group of people that helped you come out of your shell? Like, what did they do? They just like they did. They didn't do or not do anything. Like they were just themselves and mm-hmm. expected to be accepted that way. And they expected me to be myself, and they would accept it that way too. Um, like there was just like there there was a certain amount of them taking the effort to mm-hmm. get to know me because it was effort to draw me out of my shell mm-hmm. and get me to like say more than hi um, <laughs> and hide in the corner. Um, but like, you know, they would ask me what I do. They would ask me like, you know, what kinds of things am I interested in? What books do you read? Are you reading right now? Like, you know, just talking to me. Taking an um, interest. Yeah, taking an interest in me mm-hmm. and stuff and not judging. That's awesome. Like, and y'all did it around a game table, right? So you had something in common with them too. Yeah. And it was having that common interest, um, even as it was just becoming one of my interests. Um, but like having that common, you know, denominator and stuff um, is, is always, it's always easier, I think, to relax when you're not just sitting there talking to people. Like, when you have something to do with those people. Yeah. Um, you know, instead of just, like, sitting around a table, like, it's some kind of business meeting and talking. Mm-hmm. Like, sitting around a table and playing a board game and talking and chatting and just relaxing and having fun. Mm-hmm. You know? Take some of the pressure off. It does take some of the pressure off. Because, like, if you feel like suddenly you don't want to talk anymore, you can just really focus into the game. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm just really focused on the game right now. Um <laughs> But yeah, so at the same time that I was starting to come out of my shell and stuff and started to recognize, um, I recognized that I did still have some mental health issues Mm -hmm. and stuff. And there were not things that were, you know, just having a great group of friends could solve. Right. Um, But having seen that, like that acceptance and stuff, like it almost gave me the confidence to seek help in other ways. Oh, cool. Um, And so, you know, I... I went to a doctor for the first time in like five years. Um, wow. To deal with both my mental health issues and some of the physical issues I had been having. Mm-hmm. Um, and started that whole process and, you know, eventually got into, you know, being my, my mental health being managed by an actual psychiatrist mm-hmm. and um, a few diagnoses that, one was, you know, the bipolar was not necessarily a surprise to me because I have a sister with bipolar. Mm-hmm. Um, the part that was a surprise to me, but shouldn't have been, um, was that I am on the autism spectrum. Wow. There's just like the, all these little things that are suddenly like, oh, <laughs> I have this understanding now because I understand this about myself. Um, and so that helped breed into like this healthier mental health status that I'm in now. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a long journey to get where I am and I'm still not a hundred percent. You know, I, I still work continuously with my therapist, with my psychiatrist, um, managing both, you know, my own things that I can do for myself and also medication based Mm -hmm. um, to help keep me stable. Um, but it still all goes back to, you know, gaming in itself, Mm -hmm. you know, the people that I had in gaming, like the people I met through gaming, but, um, you know, how, how did, uh, gaming, I mean, did, did gaming help you cope with some of those mental health challenges that you were facing? Definitely. Um, because especially RPGs, because there's a certain level of escapism. 
Mm -hmm. um, and getting to be somebody that you're not. Mm -hmm. um, but also just that being able to, again, be somebody that you're not, let you explore things that you might want for yourself. Okay. Um, so it lets you explore being this more outgoing person because your character is outgoing. You might not be outgoing. Maybe you want to be outgoing, but you're not. But mm -hmm. your character is. Um, and the people so, at the table ex accept that, right? Yeah, they, <laughs> they accept whatever your character wants to be because you're the one playing the character. And them accepting the character that way um, shows that maybe they would accept you that way. Yeah. But it definitely, it definitely all, to me at least, comes back to gaming. Mm -hmm. um, because, and especially when you start talking about people with those social development issues, I think gaming can be used as a form of therapy mm -hmm. um, for them. Particularly, particularly roleplay games, because if you think about it, like, therapists already use roleplay. Mm. Um, especially with kids. Um, to teach them how to interact with the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have someone who has never ordered at a restaurant before, and they're terrified to do so. Um, your therapist may say, okay, let's practice, and I'm going to be the waitress, and you're going to be the customer, and, you know, it's still role-playing. Yeah. Um, and so, it's role-play is already used in therapy, and I think... Um, to teach social skills and like um, how to problem solve mm, yeah. and, um, and all this stuff can be used in a variety of people with social disorders, whether it's just social anxiety or if it's autism or if it's, you know, any other, there's mood disorders um, that can cause social problems, um, anger disorders. Mm -hmm. You know, you take somebody who has an anger disorder and their first instinct is to lash out or attack or whatever to solve a problem. Yeah. And you put them in a role play game that doesn't have a combat system. Well, then what do they do? <laughs> and they have to learn how to talk their way around things. Mm -hmm. um, it's like imposing, like the rules kind of impose restraints on you, but in a way that challenges you right to mm -hmm. do something different that makes a lot of sense yeah and and it and then and then there is that escapism part of it mm -hmm. um for people who just have like severe social anxiety um you know they can use that to um use that platform mm -hmm. to be someone that they're not because that was definitely my biggest issue was social anxiety. Yeah. Um, and I still have social anxiety from time to time. Like, if I'm going to go meet up with a group of people I've never met before, or there's going to be people I don't know there, know there, like, I still have social anxiety about it. Um, yeah. But I have more of a understanding of myself now and ways to cope with it. Um because I practiced those skills in such a way that taught me how I can handle things. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. We're going to take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to hear about the impact that one gaming community in particular has had on Missa. Stay tuned. Hey friends, I hope you've been getting some great stuff out of these episodes. If you like what you've heard so far, please check out our merch shop over at victormediagroup.co. Every purchase supports me personally, so I would love it if you cover your shit in my stickers. <laughs> Remember, you can nab a replay merch over at victormediagroup.co. And once again, thanks so much for joining us at the game table. We're back on replay talking with Missa Dawson about mental health and gaming. Uh, Missa, we've heard about how gaming has helped you to learn to manage your social anxiety and helped with your own social development in many ways. Um, and now I know this is where the story gets really tough. Can you talk to me about how gaming communities and especially the critical role community have influenced your mental health? 
Yeah, and, and so I, I learned these skills in gaming. Mm -hmm. um, and found these skills to be accepted in community mm -hmm. and stuff. And I've met amazing people through communities, through the communities that I've found. Mm -hmm. um, Critical Role being one of the biggest communities, the most accepting communities that I've found. Yeah. Um, who actually played a huge, huge role on me, with me, um, through a very rough period of time. Um, there was a couple year period where my depression got really, really bad. Mm -hmm. um, and looking back, I think it was the beginning of the burnout that I felt from the medical field. Oh. Um, but I, I, you know, this was a couple years after I'd gone into gaming and I got the people who were my support system. And I, um, I still ended up in this deep depression mm -hmm. um, that just nothing could really shake me out of. I actually almost lost interest in gaming at that time. Um, and um, then I was on Facebook one day and a friend of mine mentioned something about a critical role mental health group. Hmm. I'm like, oh, you're part of some mental, some gaming oriented mental health group. Um, which I had heard of Critical Role. I had tried to watch it, didn't get very far. <laughs> um, because especially in the first campaign at the very beginning, the audio quality is very poor mm -hmm. and that just turned me off. Um, and the fact that I've always had a hard time just sitting and watching something for long periods of time because yeah. I'm ADHD um, amongst all, all my other things. <laughs> you just have like a list of like, these are all the ways I'm very I've got whole alphabet soup. <laughs> like, girl, I've got BPD, OCD, ADHD, ASD, like, wow, GAD, like, I got the whole alphabet soup. Let's throw in <laughs> the LGBT letters too. Like, yeah, LGBT, <laughs> like, you really are an alphabet. Also apply. <laughs> I just, it's the whole alphabet. <laughs> um, but, uh, I joined the, the Critical Role Mental Health Group and everybody was super accepting mm -hmm. and super supportive. They didn't care that I wasn't a critter. Um, they just loved, um, which, which I've since, you know, discovered is a trait of that community. Like every fandom kind of has their, their people who are, if not toxic, at least like, they're grumpy about things. Like if you don't do things the exact way that they feel the fandom needs to be represented, like they get grumpy. Um, Critical Role doesn't have that. Wow. Like they just, I'm sure there are a couple people out there who are like that or whatever, mm -hmm. but I really don't feel like I see it. Like, I just don't feel it in yeah. that community. That community is all about love and acceptance. Um, you know, even in that, that's, that is fostered by critical world themselves, by them themselves. They sign off every single one of their episodes with don't forget to love each other. Like, oh, that's beautiful. And like, they just are all about the community and all about the people because the community built them. Yeah. They started this, that show as an experiment. Mm -hmm. They took their home game and, you know, uh, Geek and Sundry was just like, hey, let's put some cameras on you and you guys can play for an audience um, in a live stream. And they're like, sure, we'll try that. And then the outpouring of love and support, like just it, like critical will just blew up. Yeah. Um, you know, you'd see, you'd see the end of an episode where it was an hour of them opening gifts from the community. Oh my God. Um, I mean, they called it their Christmas episodes. Oh, <laughs> even when it's nowhere near Christmas, um, but it just uh, like they were built by the community and by the love and support of the community, and they turned that right back around. Mm -hmm. It's years into the show now. They're 
at least a year, year and a half into their second campaign now. Oh, wow. And their first campaign ran for two years. So they're like four to five years, or three to three to four, somewhere around there on the air now. And they're this huge staple in um, online gaming. Mm-hmm. Like, even if people are not, like, into Critical Role, you find very few gamers, RPGers, who aren't aware of Critical Role. Yeah, it's like a household name. You know, and they're making all of these, like, licensing agreements, like, they're in Hot Topic now, they have games coming out, they have a game publishing company now. Oh, cool. Um, called The Daring Confess, <laughs> which is a throwback to um, the first campaign. Um, so basically, you're like a Critical Role super fan, is what I just heard. <laughs> I am. And I am because they got me through that really rough period of my life. Yeah. Um, they and the community that I found through them saved my life. Wow. I went through that deep depression. And at the time, you know, working full time was three days a week because I did 12 hour shifts. Mm hmm. The other four days of, of the week, I would lay in my bed for 16 hours a day watching Critical Role. Wow. Um, and um, through the, the Critical Role Mental Health Group, I met a group of friends who were my first people that I ever DM'd for. Oh. Um, and that came about just kind of purely by accident. Because somebody was posting in the group about how they didn't have a group to play with. And I was like, well, there's online platforms you can find a group online to play with mm-hmm. and stuff. And so many people were like, yes, I would totally play an online group and stuff. So I made my own post. And I was just like, hey, you know, people, I made this comment on this other post. People seemed interested. Who would actually be interested in playing online? Mm-hmm. And then becomes this thing we, where we ended up with like 10 people wow and and stuff but nobody wanted to gm and i'm like i've never done it before but i'm willing to try if you guys are willing to bear with me and that's huge to go from so shy that playing was hard at first to being able to run a game with strangers i know and that's and amazing it, <laughs> and it was like even from the beginning, like, they didn't really feel like strangers to me. Oh. And that, that I think, is from, is from Critical Role. Um, but they actually became the core of my mental health support in that time. Mm-hmm. Um, where we had our, our Facebook message group and stuff. And I'd be so low. And I'd be outright suicidal. Mm-hmm. Um, and ready to just stop everything. And I'd be like, close to the group, like, hey, guys, I'm not okay. Can you help me? And love, support, like, talk me through everything um, until I was stable um, enough again. Mm -hmm. And they saved my life on multiple occasions. And I've saved their lives. Like, you know, we, we support each other. Like, and from the very beginning, we were family. That's amazing. And we are still family. Like, I'm still years later friends with them. And I'll still, like, if I hit a low period, I'll still reach out to that group and be like, guys, I'm not okay. And, you know, or people will reach out, reach out to me or us, you know, whoever in the group. And we're all, like, we're all on various schedules and stuff. So no matter yeah. what time of day you have an issue, like, it can be 3 o'clock in the morning and one of our people who is an overnight um, EMS dispatcher um she's she's awake so she's just like I'm here what do you need like oh wow you know or somebody else is awake or you know just no matter when um because we have people literally all over the world well and two there was um there was one time I came home from work and I had had a meeting with my manager that morning where it kind of came down to some real talk about whether or not I should still be working Mm -hmm. um and I came home and I was just in tears and I was just ready to go and stuff and um I put on critical role and the end of the episode there was a um 
um, segment from the community that was, what does critical role mean to me? Oh. And, and there have been a few of those segments and stuff, and I, I watch them and I always cry. <laughs> I always, <laughs> always want to cry. Um, because so many of their stories are my story. So many of them talk about how critical role saved them and stuff. And that morning, because I worked overnights, um, I sat down in my bed and instead of writing a suicide letter, I wrote a letter to Critical Role, to the cast of Critical Role, Mm -hmm. and told them what they mean to me. And so it it felt cathartic. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was like a very, I don't know, come to, you know, whatever moment of understanding about myself Mm -hmm. and understanding that like yeah my story is hard and right now is even harder Mm -hmm. but like I can do this I can survive this yeah because I have these people in my life that support me and love me unconditionally that's so powerful. That's so powerful. Do you have any advice that you could share uh, with other gamers for how to find your way into these sort of communities? Um, check out your local game stores. Like, there, you know, hopefully you have one in your area that is good has a good community Mm -hmm. um check out some online communities like you know if you're into critical role check out the critical role fan group like if you're you know whatever you're into see if there are not you know groups around for it Mm -hmm. um they're you know online is obviously no substitution for in person but it can be just as powerful. Yeah. Um, when I was going through that really rough time, it wasn't the people I knew in person. Like, they were still supporting me and still loving me and stuff. But it wasn't them that I that I turned to when I needed, when I was at rock bottom. It was the online group that I found. So online can yeah. be just as powerful. Okay. So for the existing gaming communities, right? So, like, the players... And uh, the GMs and the game store owners and all those people. Do you have any recommendations for what um, those leaders in the communities could do to help invite people in to the fold, especially people that have like social disorders like we've been talking about? But what, what can we do from people that are already inside the gaming community to keep inviting those people in? Be open, be accepting, don't judge. Mm -hmm. Like, I've I've found a few people who are like how I used to be um, Mm -hmm. through the through through the game store, and they're now part of my close group, my close friend group. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, I have this one friend who is um, more more autistic than I am. He's still high functioning enough that he can hold a job and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, he had never had someone who just openly accepted him for who he is. Wow. Like, it just, it's powerful to have that acceptance. And if you can give that kind of acceptance, please do. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if someone comes in and they're weird, you don't just be like, well, this person's weird. I don't want to be around them. Like, yeah. ex- embrace the weirdness. I swear you will learn so many amazing things from people, from the weirdos. Yeah. Like, from people who are like that. It goes back to emulate what you want to see. Yeah. If you want to foster that kind of community, be that kind of community be that kind of open and accepting, be friendly, be there, you know, you know, be whatever. Mm -hmm. But like, that's the best advice I can give to people who want to encourage that kind of community Mm -hmm. and to 
encourage those kinds of people to keep coming back to them and to be part of their community is that you have to show them that they're accepted in that community because anyone with like anybody who knows that they're different who has social um development issues Mm -hmm. like they feel the weight of trying to fit into society yeah into a society that doesn't accept them and i swear if they find a place that does accept them they're gonna come back i we built our community at the shop simply by being the kind of community we wanted to see that's beautiful that's powerful Uh, i think that's a good place to wrap up so at this point i just want to invite you um are there any final thoughts that you want to share uh, with whoever's listening today? The biggest takeaway I want people to understand from today is gaming helped my mental health a lot. Gaming is not the only thing. Like, do not rely, like, say gaming is going to solve all your problems. Mm -hmm. If you have mental health issues, seek help. Mm -hmm. Seek out therapy. Seek out, you know, go to your doctor, tell them you're struggling you know, and there be understanding of the resources that are out there. The National Suicide Hotline, hotline, there's LGBTQ, IA plus hotlines, Mm -hmm. you know, um, there's, there's even apps for therapists now um, Mm -hmm. that are helping one of the um, more prominent ones where you can just have access to a therapist, to your therapist 24 seven through Mm -hmm. like text and be like, Hey, I'm not okay right now. And they'll be there to help you. Um, And so, you know, even if you feel like you can't find a therapist in your area, there's, there's online options, Mm -hmm. you know, seek help where you need it. Yeah. uh, I like that you've told a story today about how mental health can be positively impacted by gaming in huge, huge ways. I mean, it made a huge impact on you personally. You've seen it impact other people in your life in really big ways. Um, And I think that's powerful, but you're right. It isn't the only way. Um, I hope that gaming can help people with some of the challenges that they face. I hope that gaming can help people feel accepted. And I hope that that can help people uh, feel comfortable reaching out for help in those other areas. Exactly. Um, you know, I gained the confidence to reach out to other things through gaming and the people that I have met. But, you know, it, it is recognizing what you need mm-hmm. um, and recognizing what gaming can give you and what it can't. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, thank you for sharing your whole story with us. I know there's so much more to tell, but what you shared with us today, I think is really powerful. And I I think will really help people uh, who might need to hear this story. Like you said, you found the people that you needed when you needed them, right? You found gaming when you needed it. I hope that maybe this podcast can find some people who need it. So I hope too. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on my show today, Missa. Thank you for having me, Clara. Thanks for listening. I'll be back again soon with another episode. You can find episodes of Replay and all other Victor Media Group podcasts at victormediagroup.co. Replay is a VMG original and is created, hosted, and produced by Clara Mount. The show is executive produced by J.D. Adams and Gerard Mitchell with sound design by Aaron Trinka and original music by Bison. It's the mission of Victor Media Group to make the world a better place by making ourselves better people. If you like this show, follow Victor Media Group on your favorite media channels and check out Bison's other tunes on Spotify, Bandcamp, and SoundCloud. Extra special thanks to all my listeners for hanging out with us today. Keep on playing, and remember, you're always welcome at this game table.